first post lunch uh, uh, presentation is from the uh, OpenBSD developer Yubula on recent progress in and around LibreSSL. Yeah, take it away. Thank you, Peter. Um, welcome. I, as the title indicates, I'm going to ramble a little bit about what we did in and, and around LibreSSL. Um, my name is Theo Bühler. Um, I've been an OpenBSD developer for quite some time, must be seven or eight years now. When I started here uh, as a mathematician, I didn't want to do anything uh, to do with uh, mathematics, and that's why I ended up doing crypto which has nothing to do with mathematics whatsoever. Um, yeah, I assume that everybody knows a little bit what LibreSSL is. I'd like to define it as one of the four major forks of OpenSSL. So what are these four major forks? The first one is OpenSSL itself, which started in 1998 as a fork of SSL EAY. SSL EAY is what came out of Netscape, which was the initial implementation of SSL v2, um, SSL v1 being so broken that it was never uh, published. Um, the author, uh, Eric A. Young, was absorbed into the RSA Corporation when the crypto restrictions were more or less lifted. And other people had to take over OpenSSL, and basically OpenSSL replaced SSL EAY, and the latter died. Um, over the next 16 years, uh, OpenSSL accumulated a lot of not-so-great code. Um, the code of SSL EAY be not being great either, but it was early code, it was co code of the 90s, so that was okay. Um, basically, Everybody dumped whatever research project he had in there, and it landed without all that much review, um, which led to a lot of fun and a lot of features and a lot of stuff you don't need. You may want to look at Bob Beck's talk on the beginning of LibreSSL to learn about funny things like Big Endian AMD64 support and stuff like that. I won't elaborate too much more. 16 years after 1998, a heart bleed happened. There were lots of disasters before, but nobody really looked, and heart bleed made people look. And people don't, didn't like what they saw. So committees were formed to fund OpenSSL research. People wrote articles like, the internet security is supported by two guys named Steve, one Steve being Stephen Hansen, who wrote the code, and the other Steve being a guy who managed to hire him as a contractor and did the financing. And Stephen Hansen apparently wasn't paid very good, very well for his work. And he was basically the only one remaining next to one guy who maintained the Perl assembler stuff and some contributors who contributed occasionally. And while committees were being formed, uh, some people lost patience, looked also and didn't like stuff like the memory management, which made hardly this much, this much far, uh, but worse than it already was. And OpenBSD forked LibreSSL. Um, a bit later in June, uh, Adam Langley from Google made Boring SSL public. It's not quite clear to me when Boring SSL itself actually started. Um, the commit history was a massive code dump on the 20th of June, but the fork happened in January, and there was a lot of call, and I guess uh, they started planning with uh, replacing OpenSSL by an in-house fork they could use internally in Google uh, before Heartbleed actually was discovered. And then there's a fourth fork, um, which happened quite recently, you may or may not be aware uh, of that one. So big companies, Akamai and Microsoft, wanted to have quick, and in particular quick support in OpenSSL, and uh, that was a pull request that was open for quite a while and didn't happen, so they forked OpenSSL 
It's a bit much to call it a fork. It's open SSL, but a, uh, in a patch set to add boring SSL quick API. So these are the four forks, and LibreSSL is the oldest one. Um, boring SSL is in wide use, despite there being no API guarantees. It is used by Google itself. Various projects embed boring SSL, and for instance, the crypto support in the Swift language is also based on boring SSL. Um, LibreSSL's main features, I would like to summarize them. The crown jewels, obviously, are libtls and its API. It's basically a sane wrapper, which is easy to use around the SSL API from libssl. Um, it is used throughout OpenBSD uh, in all things speaking TLS. We're using uh, libtls. It's tremendously easy to use, tremendously hard to misuse, and it just works. The second major thing we have is a clean room implementation of a TLS v13 stack, which mostly happened between 2018 and 2020. It started with a hackathon in uh, Bob's basement, where we hacked together uh, some initial things. Um, the centerpieces are a record layer written by Joel Singh and the handshake state machine written by myself. Um, it is more or less feature complete. Two major things that are missing um, are pre-shared key support, which is needed for session resumption. That is work in progress. Uh, I'm working on that right now, and it should be done in the next month. And um, I have some stuff working, some other stuff not yet, not quite yet, but there is a new release around the corner, so it should work in the next release. The second thing that is missing is uh, encrypted client hello, which would be really nice to have. But unfortunately, this is a standard that grows in size and scope, and it's tremendously complicated. Um, it started out as encrypted server name identification, so you don't have to transmit the server name you want to talk to in plain text over the net. And it turned out that this is harder than you might think. And uh, implementing that will be a ton of work. <clears throat> One thing we don't support and won't support is um, early data, zero round, round trip try, uh, 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 zero round trip, trip time data, which would be nice performance wise, but is a bit iffy security wise. Another main feature is a new certificate wa validator, which I will talk about later on. It was written by Bob. Then, I also count this as a feature, uh, is documentation. We have lots and lots of documentation written by Ingo Schwarze. And unfortunately, there's only one of him, which um, means we don't have uh, the capacity to document 3,000 functions in the meticulous manner that he does um, churn out manuals. Um, we have at least uh, 50 manuals that landed in the last year because they had a major uh, project to document things sponsored by Genua. Um, but still, there's lots and lots of stuff that is still undocumented. And one great thing about Ingo is that when he document things, documents things, he doesn't document what should be the case, but he documents what actually is the case. He figures out, oh, there's a bug, I need to fix it. So you first get a patch that fixes bugs, and then a patch um, with a documentation of the fixed thing. And one further thing is that we did a lot of lot, and a lot of code cleanup, refactoring. But the code base we started with is such an organ stable that this is a task that will never be finished. We are largely compatible with OpenSSL 1.1 these days, um, at least on all the features we both support. There are some corner cases with uh, locking and other things where it's not quite there yet, but it's usually not a big deal to support something with LibreSSL if it works with OpenSSL. This uh, fell out of a ton of work I did in the last year, but which is a bit hard to talk about, which um, 
was basically making structs opaque everywhere and using the OpenSSL accessor API throughout ports. Um, this was a lot of work, but it's not really heroic and interesting. And now that things are opaque, uh, we can say that the ABI is about as stable as the one of OpenSSL 1.1, which was one of the criticisms we faced over the last few, uh, few years, that we have plenty of ABI breaks, and most projects can't deal with ABI breaks because they never do them. Um, a bit more on OpenSSL compatibility. Um, we have lots of, and lots of stuff that is part of the OpenSSL API. We basically have what we need, and that's a lot more than we actually wanted. Um, we do not have OpenSSL 3 API support yet. Um, we don't really have plans of how to deal with that. We will see how the if-def mazes will turn out in the next few years and cook something up. Um, we have about 2,300 OpenBSD ports that link against libcrypto or libssl. There are a handful also that use libtls, but they're a very small minority. Of these, fewer than 100 need patches, which is a bit less than 5%, which isn't, of, of course isn't ideal. It would, the ideal thing would be that nothing needs patches, but it's a lot better than many people make it out to be. Of these, I, I would estimate that about a fourth are legacy software that is no longer maintained, that was never ported to OpenSSL 1.1 and needed patches to work with OpenSSL 1.1. Other things have um, upstreams that don't take patches. Other things are patches that we could upstream but didn't do it because there's so many, only so many hours we can, of work we can put into this project. And yeah, a lot more than I would like to have, but uh, it's not that bad. There are a few painful patients. Um, a really bad one is QT, because it basically has its own wrappers around the OpenSSL API, which is a macro hell, which I don't really understand why it is necessary, but basically they DL open uh, libcrypto and libssl on demand and then access these functions internally with some strange things, and whenever you uh, touch something that it doesn't expect, it will break. Another very, very painful, painful patient is PyPy, uh, because it embeds an old version of Py cryptography, and Py cryptography is the most sensitive port to uh, lit crypto changes. Basically, you look at it and it breaks. And um, Bob Beck changed something in Boring SSL, run regress, and uh, Pi cryptography broke. Uh, PyPy has a very old version of that embedded, which means that it still breaks. Upstream Pi cryptography decided to rewrite everything in Rust, which I'm very happy about because it no longer breaks if I touch anything. And then there is S Tunnel, which for some reason has a maintainer who is very hostile against LibreSSL. Why, I don't know, and I don't really care. It is also a painful thing to patch. Then, one feature that many people would like to have is support for ED25519, which is a Bernstein elliptic curve-based uh, uh, signature and cipher. And um, the problem is we do have support for this curve, but the support needs to be done using the so-called EVP or envelope API, and it's just a massive pain to land that. At some point, we'll have to do it. And then other things that people request are some uh, variants of the SHA cipher, like SHA-512-256 or SHA-3 or Blake or whatever. Most of the time you can actually do without all that stuff, but many things start using that. So at some point we will probably have to suck it up and land that. So far it wasn't really deemed necessary. Then six ports link against OpenSSL for various reasons. So the DKIM 
filter uh, for OpenSMTPD has a flavor that wants to use ED25519 because it's nice small signatures. And this links against OpenSSL because we don't yet support this cipher. Not a big deal. The second one is Postfix. Um, Postfix has an OpenSSL developer who also created Dane and he pushes Dane everywhere he can which is, of course, is right, but we do not have support for Dane. And at some point we might add it, but maybe not. It's a bit intrusive. Um, Florian has some work in progress for wrapping Dane in libtls, and maybe that will land, but that won't help with Postfix. So for the time being, Postfix has to use Dane. Then another one is Pro, also known as Zeek. Um, with the recent update to uh, version 5, they started using the TLS pseudo-random function uh, for some deep uh, inspections. That's something that should never have leaked out of OpenSSL, in my opinion. Uh, OpenSSL does TLS. You don't need to know what... You know, don't need to access the cipher or the pseudo-random function. And, but it did, and of course, somebody's going to use it. Another one is Node. This is also ED25519 support. It could be patched out. Um, there's a dozen API that we could provide. If someone is motivated to port that to LibreSSL and add support to LibreSSL, I would estimate that would take about a week of work. But, well, who cares? It's uh, something self-standing. It doesn't link against anything else, so it can as well use OpenSSL. And then there is um, the NSCA. Um, next-gen uh, Nagios thing, and this uses pre-shared keys for obvious reasons. You need to be able to talk to it without all sorts of uh, network things, so you need to have a ciphered way to talk to that, and it needs PSK for that. And that might uh, be switched to LibreSSL or not. Also, it's an end thing, so who cares? And the last one is LibreTLS, which we have in port for um, testing purposes. Um, LibreTLS is a port of libtls to OpenSSL, um, and by design, this uses OpenSSL, so it needs to link against OpenSSL. So we can build the entire port stream minus six more or less important things. Um, so that means we're pretty well in shape with compatibility. Now, before I talk about the validator, I would like to do a little bit of technical stuff and give you some background on certificates. Um, so what is a certificate? Well, it's a complicated struct, which won't surprise you. The ASN1 um, definition is on the screen. It is a sequence consisting of a TBS certificate, a signature algorithm, a signature value. So what is a sequence? A sequence is basically a struct. Um, what is TBS? TBS means to be signed. And the contents of this struct is something that is to be signed, something that says how it is signed, and the signature itself. So far, so good, nothing complicated. Now, let's look at the TBS certificate. The TBS certificate is again, again a struct. It contains a version. The version nowadays is always free. Uh, you won't find any other certificates in the wild, usually, or I hope you don't. Um, it contains a serial number. The serial number is something that uniquely identifies the certificate um, so that you can pinpoint what the certificate was that misbehaved and uh, that the signing certificate authority can check what went wrong with it or at the time of signing. Then it uh, con contains something which is, again, an algorithm identifier which must match the one in the outer struct. Um, I won't go into why it is there. Then it contains a field called issuer. This identifies the... Um, the certificate authority that signed it. 
You have a validity field which says from when until when the certificate is valid. There's lots of fun stuff in there because there are two formats of um, how the time is formatted depending on whether the date is before nine, uh, 2050 or after. And um, yeah, it's complicated. Then there's a subject which identifies what is signed. There's a subject public key info which um, tells you what the key is that is signed. Then there's uh, some unique identifiers for the issuer and the subject, which aren't very important to us. And then there is the thing that makes things really fun. These are certificate extensions. Certificate extensions are things uh, like the subject alternative names or many other things, uh, what policies the certificate must follow. And this is what makes certificate um, verification complicated. The main thing I need to point out is that a single certificate has a pointer to the issuer, which says, who signed me, and um, a pointer to who am I. And this creates a link between two certificates, which makes validation of certificates not only a cryptographic thing where you verify a signature, but you need to find in some graph the issuer of the certificate. So validation is pretty much a pathfinding algorithm in a bunch of certs, some of which you trust, some of which you have, might or might not trust, and some of which you want to know something about. So you need to uh, walk a path and see if there is a path of validly signed things where all the extensions do behave as you want them to. And um, that's something I will talk about a little bit later, but let's look at the PEM encoded certificate, which you might have seen on your computer at some point. It is between uh, an armor which starts with begin certificate, then there's some uh, base 64 encoded blob, and it ends the certificate. There might be some stuff above it or below it that describes what this uh, certificate is, which is of no importance of the parser. Um, if you ever wondered what PEM meant, uh, that's privacy enhanced mail, because I think uh, it was invented by the PGP guys and they wanted to privacy enhance mails, so they um, embedded things inside header and footer and um, encrypted or signed stuff. And because a certificate is also a mail, um, it uses the same thing. Um, and well, it's base 64 encoded DIR, and DIR are distinguished encoding rules, which are a particular encoding of the ASN1. And if you ever looked at this, a few certificates, you may have wondered why the certificates always starts with MII. I claim that, and you can verify that on an OpenBSD system. There are 133 uh, CA certs in OpenBSD's root bundle. You can grab that by looking for the beginning of the uh, ASCII um, marker. And of these all start with the letter MII. So why is that? So it is base64 encoded. So let's pipe that into base64 decode. Um, then hex dump it and look at what we get. And what we get is uh, three hex numbers because A64 encoded translates each letter or each ASCII character from the base64 alphabet to a six bit value, which means that we have four six bit values which translate to um, 24 bytes, which are three uh, hexadecimal numbers. The first number is 30, sorry. 30 is their speak for an ASN1 sequence. An ASN1 sequence is what a certificate is. So the certificate structure is this uh, blob. The 82 is their speak um, for the length that follows has length 2. So the two bytes following the 82 encode the length of the entire blob. <clears throat> So MII is the base 64 of 30 hex, 82 hex, plus the two most significant bits of the length, 
because um, it encodes 18 um, bits. 3 times 6 is 18, so we have 2 bytes plus 2 bits. The length of a cert is always l uh, more than 127 uh, bytes, so you need at least 2 bytes to encode it. So it is a sequence of something that is encoded by at least two bytes, and it's almost never something that is longer than uh, 16K, unless you are some university certificate on the Philippines and have 2,500 subject alternative names listed in your extensions. So, uh, well, tough. Um, you don't start with MII, but all reasonable certificates have something between 127 bytes and 16K, so the first two letters are um, 30 and 82, which is a sequence of something that has length 2, and that's why. Now, let's pass on to the uh, new certificate validator. As I said, it's a, a, a complicated thing, a pathfinding algorithm, and complicated things tend not to have nice code in the code base we inherited in 2014, and the validator is pretty much unmaintainable because it's a huge spaghetti mess of things that you just can't reason about. So during lockdown, uh, Beck wrote uh, a new one from scratch, just using some utility functions. As he likes to put it, he got COVID and lost his taste of smell, so he could dive into that. Um, the initial code of Bob's validator was pretty much correct. There was some corner cases that we needed to fix, but you always have that if you do something complicated. We only found two minor bugs. Uh, a few minor bugs, more than two, but nothing serious. But then the fun started. Uh, we needed to make that compatible to the legacy verifier, and this resulted in many, many months of whack-a-mole. Basically, it took up one year of development of LibreSSL, and uh, it was only just finished. Because lots of software relies on strange error codes that make no real sense outside the context of the legacy validator. It doesn't make any sense if you look at the RFC itself. Uh, but some software needs that you behave exactly this way in, uh, way in exactly the situation, otherwise it breaks. It needs many things depend on undocumented behavior of the verifier callback, which uh, ties in with this strange and overly specific error, error code. And some things even be, rely on you have to traverse things this way, otherwise we break, or at least we have regression tests that break. Uh, it took us, as I said, two years to, to be reasonably compatible with the legacy ver validator. We're almost there, but not just yet. As I said, um, it's very brittle. You fix one thing and you break ten others. But in the end, Bob managed to do it. But not without introducing one uh, not-so-nice hole, which failed to verify client certificates. Fortunately, we uh, plugged that very quickly. <clears throat> Another nice thing that we have um, is the legacy record layer rewrite. The record layer is something completely unrelated to uh, certificates. It's the thing that translates between what um, we get on, from the network, say on the socket that speaks DLS, and then translates uh, the fragmented messages into um, messages that the TLS stack can uh, understand and vice versa. So it's the thing that underlies um, and pr provides the abstraction needed for handling TLS. And Joel Singh wrote um, one of the nicest pieces of codes I've ever read, which is this record layer from, for TLS 1.3. And he already had the plan when he wrote that to adapt that for the old stuff, uh, TLS and DTLS, uh, which are currently driven by the legacy stack. And um, he wrote the record layer for TLS 1.2 and DTLS. He has as a goal to remove SSL packet.c and d1 packet.c, which are terrible, terrible code. 
basically um, SSL packet existed already, and then some PhD student took that, copy-pasted it, and adapted it as long as it needed so that he could play games over UDP and encrypt it with TLS, which was what DTLS was for. Um, the rewrite uses two things from Boring SSL which are needed to deserialize and serialize ASN1 things, um, it's a CBS and CBB API, which stands for CryptoByte strings and CryptoByte buffers. And this avoids any explicit point manipulations, which makes the code that much safer. With this work, we got DTLS 1.2 uh, support uh, pretty much for free. As a consequence, Landry could port um, Linphone. He could update the Bearship stack to using DTLS 1.2 which is quite nice. Another very nice thing that fell out of this is Clemens Nandi's work uh, of porting the Telegram desktop client to OpenBSD, which apparently just works. One missing bit is we do not have support for the bio-adder things, um, so Qt can't use that yet, which means that we have to compile Qt without DTLS support, which is a bit unfortunate because it would enable some nice things. Then, uh, another uh, nice thing, which is brand new, is the Quick API, which I already mentioned in the beginning. It is the de facto standard API for doing Quick. It was designed by David Benjamin, one of the main developers of Boring SSL at Google, in parallel with writing the uh, 9001 RFC, uh, which defines part of Quick. Um, this was ported to OpenSSL by Todd Short from Akamai. He opened the pull request, um, 8797, if you want some um, fun, entertaining read, and uh, you will need a lot of popcorn. Um, so they said, we can't take that. We're already late for OpenSSL 3. This, will, this feature will have to wait for OpenSSL 3. In May 2021, Quick was finally uh, standardized. In September 2021, OpenSSL 3 was released, so people were eager to use Quick, but couldn't because this pull request was still open. Um, uh, Daniel Stenberg from Curl wrote a blog, this is the API we want, and they just don't want to merge. And a few weeks later, it turns out, or it was communicated that OpenSSL want their own stack which means not just the API, but really the whole protocol implementation. The real bummer was they don't want to be compatible with boring SSL, which means that a lot of work um, that was invested in NGTCP2 and other things won't uh, be inter interoperable without patching, because um, for some reason, I don't know why, but someone must have a reason. Maybe someone wants a challenge, maybe it's NIH, maybe there's a good reason, I don't know. It was not explained. And people were surprised because quick transport protocol dealing with uh, nitty-gritty of UDP is not really within what is perceived to be OpenSSL's expertise. That shouldn't be surprising because that's crypto stuff and not networking stuff. And in November 2021, there was an IETF site meeting um, by Rich Saltz and some other people, um, and they announced the fork Quick TLS. Um, this is a hugely entertaining uh, video conference. Um, I call this RFC 90210, which is a lot of highly paid executives um, lamenting the fact that they now own a fork of OpenSSL, which they don't want to. So further stuff about uh, the Quick API. Uh, Bob Beck and Joel Singh ported that to OpenSSL. Bob started that um, in June in Bruges with a few days. And uh, it took Joel a bit longer than we thought, but it must be a few nights work and he had it working. Um, it plugged extremely nicely into Joel Singh's record layer. Um, the design just worked out. A little bit of refactoring was necessary, but that's always the case if you need to fit in something new. 
Um, one thing it needed is um, EVP Charger 20 Poly 1305 support. This was quite painful, but um, yeah, since we wanted quick, this was ported as well. Um, EVP uh, is the crypto abstraction layer, which is the recommended way of dealing with ciphers, which makes things that can be done in a single API call need 20 API calls, because EVP is nice. Um, an experimental version of this API will be available in LibreSSL 3.6. If you compile NGTCP2 and curl, you get a thing that can speak quick with this API without any patches, patches needed. And just a few days ago, um, William Lallemand uh, from the HA proxy um, project landed a working version, the HA proxy master branch, which is minimal but apparently working. Full support will need that we add uh, a wonderful API uh, to our stack. Basically, it allows you to get the things that will be parsed at SSL extension um, as raw things, which you then can manipulate and have parsed by the SSL stack. Very well done. Um, the boring SSL API works, but it's not great. That may be one of the reasons that contributed to the decision of OpenSSL, to be fair. So the first thing is it exposes full structs and enums publicly, which is really, really bad, because it means that whenever you need to change one of these structs, you have a flag day. And because nobody can deal with flag days, it means it can't uh, ever be changed. And surprise, Boring SSL and QuickTLS have already div diverged. So Boring SSL changed the struct and have two members where QuickTLS has, uh, has only one member because it's the old version of Boring SSL API. And the cherry on top is that NGTCP2 initialized the struct without C99 initializers, which means that uh, you need to be very careful how you pack things so that things don't blow up, but it can be done. Boring SSL, you have a very good contact to them because there are some contacts. Um, David Benjamin wrote a letter to us and said they are open to improvements, so maybe we can do something there. But unfortunately, QuickDLS is probably set in stone. So there is a pull request that is open since beginning of November 21 that says, well, we don't match Boring SSL and we should change that, but we can't because it's an ABI break. Now, something very near and dear to my heart as a mathematician is work on primality testing. The starting point of this saga is a wonderful preprint from 2018 called Prime and Prejudice, um, which found some rather disturbing facts. I'm quoting from the abstract. They are able to construct 2048-bit composites so numbers that are not prime numbers that the prime primality test will declare as prime with a probability of 1 16th. This is as bad as it sounds. And uh, the documentation which LibreSSL inherited from OpenSSL in this situation says, it's very unlikely, don't worry about it, it's 2 to the minus 80. That's an off by 40 and an exponent, um, an off by 20 in an exponent, which is very bad. But LibreSSL and OpenSSL aren't the only ones affected by that. They found a number of libraries where they can construct numbers that will always declare prime um, by the supplied um, primality tests. Um, this is tricky to fix. There's an easy workaround, which is very unsatisfactory, which means uh, just crank up the number of rounds of Miller Rabin. And primality is already very, very expensive to check, so you can't just do a, a factor of 10 more tests because it's just too slow. The recommendation is to use um, an algorithm which is named after four famous mathematicians, uh, BPSW. The problem is this isn't easy. Someone needs time, time and skills to implement that. So, Fortunately, there are some people in the world who have both combined, 
and Marc Dangreno, you is one of them. The background to this is um, Marc Espy found the preprint earlier this year independently. He contacted us um, saying, well, uh, this is something that might be interesting, and I have a student who has a knack for math. Would you be interested in looking at that with him? Of course. Martin already had an implementation in Python of this algorithm. He apparently didn't have much experience with C, but he said, well, I can do it. Okay, uh, it can't be worse than not work. And a few weeks later, I have a pretty good C implementation in my inbox. It was obviously written by someone who isn't very experienced in C, but the most important thing, it had very few bugs, it was correct, and it was fixable. So, as always, if you work with a student, you have breaks because there were exams. No big deal, a few weeks, no work, but then we sat down. We had something that worked. Um, we had the mostly correct implementation, so we cleaned it up, optimized it, simplified it, fixed it, and committed it. The result is one of the nicest pieces of code in LibCrypto, which is a very low bar, but it's still a very nice compliment. And it's an, a piece of amazing work by Martin Grenouilloux. There is something that Job wanted to have, which is uh, RFE uh, 3779 support. This is about routing and BGP. Basically, it's an X509 certificate extension for IP addresses and um, identifiers of autonomous systems. The issuer of a certificate transfers some internet numbers to the subject. Um, this is uh, part of LibCrypto, which is ported. There's a P missing here um, by Job. It helps our PKI client and makes uh, the OpenSSL X509 output nicer. Uh, unfortunately, it needed a lot of work. The public API is pretty broken, and it's inefficient, and it costs about 10% of runtime performance loss of our PKI client, which is too bad, but not as bad as it could be. I have five more minutes, three more minutes. Um, so, there's always a lot of work on testing ongoing. Uh, Ilya Shipitsin, one of the HA proxy guys, um, has been tremendously helpful with um, dealing with all sorts of GitHub stuff. He um, helped us uh, spinning up the ASAN com um, continuous integration thing, which has been invaluable. Um, he also helps us with uh, triage, uh, triaging uh, coverity issues. Then we use um, TLS fuzzer to fuzz, which is a protocol fuzzer to check whether our um, implementation is uh, compliant. It tickles many corner cases and he'll uh, help improve standards compliance a lot. And thanks a lot to Hannes Mehnert who mentioned it to me at BSD CAN after my talk. Um, it was tremendously helpful. Then we have uh, Jeremy, a Ruby guy who needed us to take care that this Ruby gem doesn't break. So we ran that as part of our regress tests as well, and it has been very useful because it covers stuff we don't have good co coverage for. And a very nice thing that happens a few weeks ago is that the eldest son of Joel Singh started sending pull requests, and he uh, rewrote and improved lots and lots of old tests that nobody wants to look at. And um, unfortunately, he stopped after I uh, threatened him with having to deal with CVS himself. Um, hopefully, it won't scare him off permanently. I'd like to uh, finish with some stack, uh, thanks. First of all, the core team of LibreSSL, which are Brent Cook, Bob Beck, um, Kinichiro Inoguchi, and Joel Singh. Uh, Ingo Schwarze, because he's the best. Um, Antoine and Stan, because they're all also the best for all their help with ports. Uh, Genua um, is tremendously helpful with all the testing infrastructure and also for sponsoring work. Then, of course, as I said, Martin Grenouilloux for his wonderful work on DPSW. Ilya Shipitsin for help with Portable. Then one person uh, called Orbi, or what, however you pronounce that, uh, working on Gen 2 and has been extremely active with updating patches, pulling patches out of our ports tree and upstreaming stuff. It's uh, very, very helpful to have people like that around. And finally, the OpenBSD Foundation, which sponsored a bulk build machine that allowed me to do uh, testing in ports so that 
Nadi and Stuart Henderson didn't have to run into breakage, which make, makes bumpingly crypto a non-issue these days. That's all I have. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Any questions? I'm sorry? No what? Oh, um, I'm not as long time a member of OpenBSD. Uh, I don't look, use match point, magic thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I should have. I need to write a LaTeX plugin for that. The question was, why is there no comic sense um, in my presentation? Other questions? So I guess we're right on time for a break. Just about out of time. So uh, thank you very much for a great presentation, Gio. And here is the uh, speaker gift. Uh, awesome. Tra traditionally lo local specialty for Vienna. Thank you very much. It's a Sacher Torte, if you're curious, and I won't share it. And then again, let's thank our speaker.